We're looking for people who can convince us about things in an analytical way, but also in a way that is easy, easy to grasp. Now we have done investments without even meeting the founders in person. This is a new normal. We believe at Venture Friends that investing in, in other startups, in different founders, in different cultures, enhances the collective understanding of the space, improves the outcomes for everyone. The, the whole region is not just Greece, but I think what we all lack is more ambition. To be pragmatic, technology doesn't always uh, solve the problems that are the most pressing for society. Most of the people I would pitch the idea would say no. When I decided to really devote myself into something, I had this very strong view that what I'm doing uh, will be successful. Hello everyone and warm welcome to our virtual trip to Athens, where we're going to meet a very special guest, Apostle Sotoktonaki from Venture Friends, who is actually one of the most active stakeholders in the Greek startup ecosystem. My name is Irina and I'm part of the Recursive, the community-born media platform for innovation in Southeast Europe. I'm going to introduce the postulus also to our audience. Um, he's a serial, serial entrepreneur who turned investor later on. He actually started his career in a corporate environment at the Boston Consulting Group, but only two years after being a consultant, he started also on his entrepreneurial path and co-founded several ventures. On the poster record, you can also see a 10 million plus exit. I'm also curious to find out a bit more about this one. And since 2010, Apostolos has been investing in companies on uh, one side as a business angel and on the other also as a partner at Venture Friends. Venture Friends uh, was launched in 2016 and was the first 100% private venture capital fund Later on, you managed also to attract some funding from the European Investment Fund, and uh, since then you've been distributing it very successfully to ventures and startups in, in Greece. So, yes, Apostolos, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. That was a pretty full description of my <laughs> past. Can you tell us a bit more about uh, what you have been doing in the new normal? It doesn't feel like the new normal, but uh, when we, when I think about it, it, some things have changed. So we we have become more international as a fund, and this was facilitated further. In the past, we traveled a lot um, to to meet with founders. Now we have done investments without even meeting the founders in person. This is a new normal, uh, and. This allows us to meet with more founders. The fact that we don't have to travel, we have become more efficient. This coincides with our vision to become a more uh, European fund and getting more active on Eastern Europe and the uh, uh, rest of Europe. From your perspective, how um, has your role in the community evolved over time? And uh, are your vision and goals somewhat different now compared to what, say, in 2004? 2004. 2004 was a very different phase for me because I was still an entrepreneur. So my vision was a bit more narrow. It was about the success of my startup at the time, the first e-commerce company. Then back in 2009-10 is when I, I became... Uh, I became uh, an angel investor through my involvement with Open Fund. I got exposed to other ambitious, uh, capable founders. And in essence, my first angel investment was at Taxibit, um, where I was enthused by, by the idea, by the potential, by the drive of the founder to, to create an international company. And that was my first experience in how to get a local success story and export it to, to, to Latin America. By the way, what a leap, Latin America. So I think the real beginning of the ecosystem was back then, like 2010-11, when we had uh, Taxibit and Workable, and we had some local champions that also emerged and started to gain traction, gain awareness, like eFood, the company I was a co-founder. Even though we were a Greek play, this was a company that 
everybody knew of and could see the, the, the tremendous growth we experienced in those years. If I think back then, we were really at a very early stage of the ecosystem, very few case studies, very few international case studies. Now it's a totally different story. We have gone through phases where we had exits of a certain size that uh, when you compare those sizes with the rest of Europe, you would say, okay, these are not very, very large exits uh, up until five years ago. But recently, we really broke the ceiling. The exit of uh, Softomotive to Microsoft, which was above 100 million, uh, Instashop, 360 million, and also an investment in Scrooge, um, the marketplace for e-commerce in Greece. The size of the sector is increasing. The, the number of companies that can reach exceed values of 100 million is, uh, is bound to increase. So we are in a totally different uh, period now. Because apart from those visible successes, the exits, we also have at least 20 startups from Greece that are expanding internationally successfully and really have what it takes to become global successes. I can name a few like Blue Ground or Spotter Wheel or Hack the Box or NetData. But I think the, the reality is that it's just many. Five years ago, we would talk about a few, like two or three we could name. Now it's like uh, at least 20 companies that have really uh, the potential to become very large. How many unicorns do you have at this uh, time currently? Do you know that? If we have uh, companies that are trending to become unicorns? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we do. I mean... Uh, I believe we have at least two companies that are training to become unicorns and we'll, we'll make it happen in the next two, three years. I believe Blue Ground is in an, in an amazing trend, even though it, it went through a difficult phase in the US because of uh, what we all experienced with Corona, but they have picked, picked up again. Um, they regrouped they, and they are back in growth phase. And I think we'll have a couple of other companies that can also uh, they're a bit earlier to say, but I think they really have a chance to become unicorns, to reach the unicorn status. You mentioned that uh, your role at Venture Friends is also becoming a bit more international. So moving forward, should we expect more regional co-investments from Venture Friends? Uh, do you see yourself joining forces with funds uh, in Romania, in Bulgaria, maybe in Serbia? Yes. No, that's that's a, that's a great um, that's a great point. We. In the beginning, and this has to do also with the role I, I saw for myself and Venture Friends back in the beginning. In the beginning, we saw this big gap uh, in Greece. There was no funding in Greece. That's why we launched Venture Friends as the first private-only fund. And there was really this thirst for capital. There were driven people out there and there was no capital. But we always had the aspiration to bring together other like-minded founders from the region and from Europe in general. We believe at Venture Friends that investing in, in other startups, in different founders, in different cultures, enhances the collective understanding of the space, improves the outcomes for everyone. Because it's through this exchange of uh, experiences, we all have slightly different viewpoints and experiences. And that's how teams learn. They learn by interacting with other teams and uh, helping each other, exchanging knowledge and understanding of, of their spaces. So we always wanted. Now we feel that we have the firepower. We're raising a larger fund. And we have already done a few investments in, in, uh, in Europe. And we are ready to, to accelerate and have a clear focus in uh, partnering with other funds in, um, in Bulgaria, Romania, Serbia, for sure, uh, as well as Poland or other European countries. That's a clear uh, milestone. In, in the beginning, it was like we felt this responsibility, this sense of urgency, because there was no funding, right? It was, you, you felt that there was this mission, you had to support every founder in every, in every sector, because you know, tech is, is quite wide. From our side, our experience is mostly in consumer, uh, SaaS, e-commerce, marketplaces. Gradually, we expanded to fintech, propec prop tech and travel tech. But still, with, with the first fund, what I realized that we feel this urge and this sense of responsibility to, in, to invest in even in slightly different uh, spaces um, in order to support the founders that had no other options. 
Now there are more funds in Greece and other regional funds that are also investing in Greece. We are narrowing a bit the scope by investing in the in the sectors that we are we have a stronger network, stronger understanding, so consumer SaaS, uh, fintech, and, and the rest. But we are expanding on the geographical scope, which is uh, makes it very interesting again, because we interact with uh, like-minded people from from other uh, geographies. Looking forward to the next uh, co-investment story with a regional focus. What are the remaining missing pieces when it comes to the Greek innovation ecosystem? Or what are the areas, in your opinion, uh, that are important but very few people pay attention to so that if you reach the next maturation level? I think the, the whole region is not just Greece, but I think what we all lack is more ambition. We need more case studies of people who have achieved Uh, global, uh, creating globally competitive uh, companies. And this has to do, we don't have many case studies. I think, I believe there are ambitious people out there. They just don't know if it's feasible and they're not willing to take the step, some of them. But once they see that there are others who have done it, they will be more willing uh, to take the plunge. Also, they, they want a peer group, other like-minded people who are willing to push themselves and create international companies. They, they need this peer group to exchange ideas, To, to learn from, connect, voice their stations and their aspirations. So I think mm-hmm. this is gradually happening. So that's why I'm very optimistic also about the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. And also probably ignite each other's uh, motivation. Yes. Ex- exactly. That's, that's, that's exactly. I think one, one pushes the other, right? I mean, you see your, your peers achieving something and, and you say, okay, this is feasible. I can push harder and make it happen as well. How about the, the strengths? Um, what are Greece's top advantages in 2021 when it comes to the country's positioning as an innovation hub? Yeah, I mean, I wish I could say that we have like this unique advantage. I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say we have something unique as an ecosystem. Maybe okay, we we are as a country we have been very extrovert. We Greeks are extrovert, and we we have many. The diaspora is all over the place. Uh, globally and many Greeks have studied abroad and then have turned home so that gives us let's say uh, I, I'm not sure, sure if it's an advantage but it is a good starting point because you have people who have who have this strong work ethic deciding to create a startup requ- requires determination and also requires um, a conscious decision to to work very hard and have high standards of your work if, if you want to create a globally competitive startup. And the way for people to understand what high standard means, the way is to work in an environment that is demanding. And this is uh, more easily happening if you're working at an international organization, at another successful startup, uh, or at a, at a consulting firm, at an, at an investment banking environment, at a high performance organization, that helps you understand what high expectations uh, mean. Greeks have, many Greeks have been exposed to such environments and that um, hopefully means that many of them will also choose to undertake the entrepreneurial path, having high standards uh, with regards to what they want to achieve. Thank you. That's actually a great point. I believe that diaspora has untapped potential, especially uh, when it comes to you know, countries from our region, because we have huge diaspora communities uh, who are emotionally still uh, connected to Attached. their own countries. I yes. agree, I agree. And who are also ready to help, to, to jump in, to be there when you need some kind of connection. So definitely, I believe, uh, an advantage. Yeah, and that's, that's the other point. So one point is, okay, some people, they, they were diaspora, they came back, but then... Uh, people who are still uh, diaspora and they have chosen to stay, let's say, in the US or the UK or other countries, they can still, and they're willing, they're happy to act as mentors, as supporters, as connectors of the founders who decide to start something. Moving to my next question, which is connected to the, to the COVID situation that we're experiencing right now. What are the biggest uh, new problems that you hope see solved uh, with technology? Uh, most hopefully, uh, potentially, by Greek startups? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is a, a nice question. And there are some big problems. And to be pragmatic, technology doesn't always 
solve the problems that are the most pressing for society. Uh, we have to be very conscious of that. So for, for me, like a, a huge issue could be like fake news, but I don't see many technology startups dealing with that because probably the results and, and the, the financial benefits of that are a bit delayed and not very, very clear. Personally, I would have liked to see this problem getting solved. Uh, and technology may not be the only solution. Uh, I guess we need uh, education. And, but certainly technology helps propagate fake news and disinformation. It's, it's a bit sad to see conspiracy theories uh, getting so much acceptance from various uh, parts of society. But we still get involved with startups that also they, they do well by also doing good. So I am really excited about some startups that help with financial inclusion. Um, we have um, companies like Plum, for instance, that are helping people save. They teach them right habits, financially responsible habits. They help them learn how to invest, how to save. We have other fintech startups that we have supported that um, also help with mortgage lending. So they would be giving broader access to some people to getting their own house by doing, uh, using data better and making a better risk assessment. So there are startups that are very interesting in the fintech space, I'm excited about, uh, that are also helping um, solve some, some major issues, uh, societal issues like social mobility or financial literacy. Other than that, I have to admit that we are a bit reactive in, uh, in how we approach problems. So we are founder driven. We are receiving a huge inflow of ideas and people willing, having the passion and the drive to, to solve something. And then we educate ourselves based on how convincing the founder is. And we get carried away. We get excited by the excitement that the, the entrepreneur transmits uh, when mm. he sells his idea. So we, can, we, we get carried away, we get excited by comments that are in the e-commerce space, which should be like, it's a 20-year-old story, and, but we still get excited by comments that are improving fulfillment, for instance, or by um, uh, doing something better in the e-commerce space. Yeah. So, yeah, we're always happy to, to, to meet with people who have enthusiasm for one reason or another about a specific problem. And but then it, it doesn't matter what they're doing, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. As long as as, the, as they don't harm, they don't create something bad <laughs> for society, then it's okay. I mean... Okay, uh, I understand your philosophy. Um, now, also going back to Venture Friends portfolio, because you mentioned them, uh, you feature a number of uh, really high growth startups like Blue Ground, uh, that you also said, Plum, Sport the Wheel. You exited Instashop for 360 million. Uh, last summer, what's your secret for recognizing potential at the early stage? Uh, what are you looking at at the early stage company? You mentioned the drive of the founders. What else? Yeah, and I don't think it's a, like a huge secret. Uh, we are all looking for people who have the drive, the capacity. They're able um, to build a, a solid team. If I had to, to pick one thing that over and over is very important for me is looking at a founding team that has the ability to convey in a very persuasive and concise way what they want to do. In the sense that many people come with a pitch. Um, sometimes the pitch is not very easy to decipher and uh, people sometimes complicate things. Things need to be simple. And I believe a secret is that there are founders who are able to put things in a very simple way. Even though they may be very ambitious, we have this aha moment sometimes when there's a founder, founding team that comes over, they convey their plan. It seems very ambitious, but then they start delivering on the pieces uh, after we watch them for a few months. And, and then they, they have a very solid analysis on why, what they, what they suggest which seems very grandiose, is feasible. And this is what we're looking for. We're looking for people who can convince us about things in an analytical way, but also in a way that is easy, easy to grasp. I think this is a great skill. And this is also a leading indicator of whether those people would be able to convey the same message to their employees, to other investors. So ability to sell, but not sell in the, in the sales way of uh, over-promising, uh, 
but in a way that is substantiated while staying concise and to the point. I think there was a saying that if you cannot explain to the cleaning lady at the end of uh, your working day with leaving the office what you're working at, then you have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea? Yeah. Oh, you're not a good communicator. Uh, yeah. Maybe you have an idea. And I think most people, I, I, I would think that most people really have an idea, but they are very bad. Some of them are bad at explaining and making it simple. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's uh, an interesting test and an interesting perspective uh, looking at uh, investor speeches. I don't know if you've seen our slogan uh, at the, the recursive is stories shape stories with the idea that uh, that's what the, one successful story of one founder can ignite the next one. Uh, and this is what we're trying to do here at the recursive. So in this sense, What's the number one lesson that you learned during uh, your journey as an entrepreneur and also as an investor uh, that you want to share with the next generation of young entrepreneurs in Southeast Europe? Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the story I would, I would share is that, I, I don't know if I should share like a specific, I, mean, I can share a specific story from my background, uh, which was at any point in time when I was starting something, Uh, when I was involved in a startup, was it my first startup like eShop or eFood or Doctor Anytime, even venture friends, most of the people I would pitch the idea would say no. But in all those cases, in every beginning, uh, when I decided to really devote myself into something, I had this very strong view that was, uh, I think, based on rational criteria that what I'm doing uh, will be successful. I, I could see that it would be successful. So I think, and it's hard, sometimes it's hard to tell somebody, okay, what you're saying doesn't make sense or cannot happen. But on the other hand, building this common sense and having this understanding of uh, what is feasible and not, having this sound reality check, and then take the ambitious next step This combination is where I think, I believe it's, it's my, my, my advice. So having a solid grounding and do, doing your analysis and creating conviction, becoming convinced about what you want to do, and then ignore the people because the majority of the people will not see what you see. Then ignore them and, and move along, even though what you're doing might sound ambitious or difficult uh, for other people. That's a great advice, and I didn't expect to hear that from an investor because usually investors are also looking at the coachability of founders, and um, you know they prefer to have them open to ideas from from outside. And I think it's a very difficult to you know find the the right um, the golden how do you call it the the golden center, yeah. Ah, yes, the medium, let's say the, the, the average, let's say the, the, the medium. Um, yeah. But it's a good point that you're raising about coachability. I think coachability has to do with, it, with whether the founder is open to feedback and is open to different views. One should not be set uh, in, in her own views. Um, but on the other hand, the founding team should have like a, a, a deeper knowledge and understanding of the problem they're about to solve. So if the investor is to come and really overturn everything, then this is not about coachability. Uh, it means that there's something fundamentally wrong here. Uh, it's about knowing what you don't know and being open to accept a different view, do the analysis and accept the advice only if it is relevant and um, makes sense. Otherwise, no, you shouldn't. You shouldn't accept just because the investor says so. The investor... Um, has some experiences, but those experiences are not applicable to everything. Mm. Thank you for this wonderful conversation, Apostolos. It's been uh, a real pleasure having you here. And I hope next time you will be having me in Athens uh, because I'm planning to, to have a short trip there. Um, Happy to. And, uh, yes, <clears throat> to meet all the wonderful people that uh, I've been corresponding now uh, virtually. You're also welcome anytime here. Yes, And, I'd love uh, to come again to Sofia. <laughs>